the symbol of a great hero is courage, integrity, selflessness. They save the day and expect no reward and disappear into the sunset. The Bible also tells the story of heroes, but these heroes have not always been brave, good or selfless. In fact, they are imperfect, impatient and fearful, just like us. Then why should we be telling their stories today? What makes them heroes? Welcome back to the series Heroes of Faith. I thank God that you are still here, part of the series. And today we are in week eight of the series. Week one, we looked at Noah's obedience to God. Week two, we looked at Jehoshaphat's faith, courage, and wisdom. Week three, we looked at Abraham and how against all hope, Abraham still believed in hope. And week four, we looked at Moses making faith choices. Week five, we looked at Ezekiel faith and intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Week six, we looked at Elijah, faith and provision, how God provides supernaturally. And week seven, that is last week, we looked at from the life of David, how by faith David killed the giant, the giant killer. And today is week eight. But before we go into the message, I just want to wish all the amazing fathers out there happy Father's Day. Uh, indeed, it is a great privilege, uh, uh, you know, to be a father. Me uh, being a father myself, I've been a father just for the last year and a half. Now we got a year and a half old uh, baby, Zion. And she's given me this greatest privilege uh, to enjoy fatherhood. And uh, she's absolutely beautiful, thrilling, and she keeps our life so exciting. So I thank God for Zion and for Zion to give me this precious gift of fatherhood. And I thank God for all the great men and fathers out there. And I also take a moment to thank all my spiritual fathers. You know who you are if you're watching this online for uh, mentoring me, leading me, supporting me, praying with me and believing in me uh, through this time uh, and, and throughout my life even. Uh, so thank you to my spiritual fathers for being there and for praying with me and pr believing in my life and uh, speaking some things into my life and for that to prosper uh, through the blessings of God. So I Thank God for that. Today, uh, we're going to go into God's Word, and today we are um, going to look at a title, um, and I have titled this sermon, Persistent Faith, right? Persistent Faith. Um, if you um, are a father or a husband, you know, um, and, and this message is relevant for everybody, not just fathers, uh, it is relevant for everybody because in order to be a great father, it takes a great man to be a great father. So it takes manhood to go into fatherhood. And not just manhood, it, it just doesn't take a great man. It takes a great man of God to be a great father that God has called you to be. So in order to understand what it takes to be a great man of God and to, uh, you know, imp have that uh, for that to have an impact in your fatherhood, we got to understand something and we're going to learn from a particular character called Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah teaches us persistent faith and great leadership. If you read through the chapters of Nehemiah, you see great leadership coming out of Nehemiah, as well as how persistent uh, and persevere, uh, uh, persistently, you know, he follows God and he follows the vision and, and he's very consistent in his faith and, and how he accomplishes the task that is in front of him. So we are going to learn from the life of Nehemiah and we are all in a position of leadership. As a father, you are in a position of leadership over your family. Uh, as a husband, you're in a position of leadership. And, and uh, we're going to learn from Nehemiah how to persist in faith. Because throughout the last seven weeks, we learned about different faiths and, uh, and, and how from different people God led them. Uh, uh, and and uh, the times of weakness, the times of strength, uh, God was with them. And, and God, uh, you know, uh, shaped the faith of their lives. Uh, and it was not just um, them trying to 
achieve faith, but it's them trying to follow a God who built the faith in them. So it is amazing to see how people, various characters from the Old Testament, uh, had their faith life shaped. Uh, and, and one of the questions that many times people ask is that, Pastor, I know about faith, I know what faith is, but how do I not give up in faith? How can I be persistent in faith? How can I, you know, constantly live a life uh, in faith? So I hope as we go into Nehemiah, that it will help you to learn and understand how to persist in faith. Now, Nehemiah, just to give a little background about him, you know, God, God's providential hand was upon Nehemiah as he courageously goes to uh, the king and he asks him, the king to equip him with the necessary resources to, in order to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall and restore the community. So God's hand was with Nehemiah that he accomplished this great task in just 52 days. And we're going to find out how he did that. Now, Nehemiah carried a faith that was persistent and determination that he did not give up when he faced challenges. Now, his persistent faith started with a burden. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 1, we see that Nehemiah starts with a beautiful prayer. It starts with a burden. Today, I want to give you three aspects, three important uh, aspects from the life of Nehemiah up to the point he finished building the wall that helped him to have persistent faith. Because the, Nehemiah's persistent faith just didn't happen overnight. It was a process in his life. So we're going to understand the process. And I want to teach you three uh, important key elements, key aspects from Nehemiah's life that helped him to persist in faith. If you're making notes, I want you to write this down. Point number one, the first thing I want you to write down is turn your burdens into prayers. Hallelujah. Turn your burdens into prayers. It takes compassion and faith to have burden for others. See, when you look at Nehemiah chapter one from verse one to four, you know, it's talking about how the people uh, of, of, uh, in, in Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem was first burned down, the gates are burned down, and the people are in, ga in great distress. And this is the response of Nehemiah in chapter 1 verse 4. It says, so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and moaned for many days. I think many of us can relate to this. You know, natural human response of Nehemiah. It was not like Nehemiah always had faith moments and always was like, you know, going for God and, and he never cried, he never had emotions, he never had feelings. No, no, no. Nehemiah had feelings. Nehemiah had emotions that he went through. Nehemiah had days of weeping and moaned, right? And, and he says, but then in the later part of that verse, in in verse, uh, in the second part of that verse, in verse four, he says, "But I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven." Now here is Nehemiah who is turning his burden into prayer. Nehemiah realized that that burden he had for the people of Jerusalem, that for the, for his tribe, for his people, he realized that his burden gave him a vision. But when you look at from the outset, as we read it from the outset, maybe Nehemiah did not realize it at the time. All he knew is that I need to make this right. Lord, help me. I need to do something about this. So he allowed his burden to set a direction for his life, which then became the vision for his life. Nehemiah turned his burden into a vision. Now, this is what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah found favor in the eyes of the king, and he goes and asks for sanctions. He, first of all, he's the cupbearer to the king, and the king sees him. And you can read this in Nehemiah chapter 2, that he, looking at his face, he's a little sad about something. He's depressed. He's not been sleeping. He's been praying. He's been crying. Probably he had swollen eyes. So the king looks at him, hey, what's up, Nehemiah? You don't look the same. So Nehemiah, as he's pouring the wine for the king, he's just saying, hey, 
listen, uh, uh, king, we have some issue in Jerusalem, and I need you to let me go and rebuild the wall. And, and the king then asks, okay, what do you need? And Nehemiah just gives this list of things that he needs sanctions for. As if he, was, he was like prepared. He was ready. Because he did not sit with his burdens. He turned his burdens into prayer. And the prayer built faith in his life, which later drove him to turn those prayers into action. A lot of us are sitting with burdens in our heart and you're letting your burdens turn into depression. You're letting your burdens turn into sadness. Rather, take your burdens in prayer to God, which later makes, which, which what will happen is that your prayers will then get converted into a point of action through the faith that you receive when you go to the presence of God. I hope I'm making sense to somebody because Nehemiah did not sit with his burdens, but rather his burdens gave him a vision and the vision led him to his people in order to rebuild the wall. It built his faith. It gave him a vision. It gave him a cause. It gave him a reason. It gave him a direction for his life. What is leading your life today? Are you letting your burdens lead your life into depression, into sadness, into worry, and into making you feel like you can't do anything about it? Or can you take your burdens in prayer to God, turn them into prayer, so that through prayer and the presence of God, you receive faith, which then turns into action. What are we doing with our burdens? Now, Nehemiah receives all the sanctions that he needed from the king. And here is step two that Nehemiah does. Step one is turn your burdens into prayer. And step two, I want you to write this down. Your adversaries are there to strengthen your faith. Your adversaries are there to strengthen your faith. When you look at Nehemiah, we move on into chapter 2. Now, Nehemiah got the sanction from the king, got everything ready and sorted to go. And then if you read in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, it says, When Sanballat, the, the Horonite, and to Tobiah, the Ammonite, official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Here is two characters now, the adversaries, the challenges that God probably allowed to happen in Nehemiah's life and not to slow him down, but to strengthen his faith. When you move forward in faith towards the vision that God has placed in your life, you will face characters that will mock you. You will face characters who will challenge you. You will face characters who will talk you down. But remember, those characters, God has placed them in your life not to stop you, not to harm you, but to strengthen your faith. Don't let your challenges discourage you. We know one of the biggest key that the enemy uses in order to get into people and slow them down and stop them from fulfilling the purposes of God in their life is this key called discouragement. He brings discouragement into your life and he causes this overwhelming sense of feeling that everything is going wrong because of just one thing and you're constantly feeling discouraged about everything. And, 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 and that discouragement, that emotion then leaks into your marriage, it leaks into your children, it leaks into your family, it leaks into your uh, church, it leaks into your working environment, it leaks into your sense of leadership, it leaks into everything that you do that you feel drained, you feel discouraged, and you stop moving in faith. Don't let your adversaries, don't let your challenges, don't let your enemies stop you, but rather strengthen your faith. Come on, somebody shout amen. Now see, in Nehemiah chapter 2, if you go down a little bit from, to verse 18 and 20, it says, And I told them, this is, what, this is Nehemiah speaking, And I told them the hand of my God, which had been good upon me. Now Nehemiah is confident about the hand of God over his life and also of the king's word that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. 
Now here is Nehemiah raising a bunch of people to rise and build up. And, and when he's doing this good work, here comes the adversaries. Here comes the challenge. He says, but when Sanballat and Tobiah, the, the Geshem, the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Turn to somebody and tell them, look at them and tell them. If you are a father, pray this prayer over your wife and your children and your family. Pray this over them and say, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. The God of heaven, turn to the person next to you, tell them, if you're watching on your own, just, just shout it out. The God of heaven will prosper me. Put your hand over your head and even bless yourself. Put it over your heart. Bless yourself. The God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. Now, nothing is stopping Nehemiah. Nehemiah is persistent in his faith. Even when the officials, even when Sanballat and Tobiah is against him and trying to stop him, mock him, laugh at him, and their agenda is to stop the progress of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is saying confidently that the God of heaven himself, I don't need you or the, you know, or, or the favor from others. I know that God's hand is upon this. Because I have seen even the king favor this, so I'm going to keep going. We will arise and build. Can you be confident in the calling that God has placed over your life? Can you be confident as a father, as a husband? Can you be confident as a leader? Can you be confident as a wife, as a mother? Can you be confident in whatever that God has called you to be? Can you be confident saying that God himself will prosper me? I know it is a very difficult time, tough times. Businesses are turning, uh, you know, the dynamics are turning around. The economic, uh, economic crisis uh, is, is kind of um, coming out a little bit more than before in this month. And we don't know how the next month is going to be. And there's a lot of uncertain elements that is playing in your life, in my life, in the life of our church. Uh, many uncertain things are happening. But... In the midst of it all, church, I'm calling out to you. I'm saying as we celebrate our third year anniversary this month, I am calling out to you. Let us not stop here. Let us not give up. Let us rise up and build because the God himself will prosper us. Come on, somebody shout amen. The God himself will prosper us. The God himself will prosper King City Church. The God himself will prosper your life. Be confident in the faith. Be confident in the hand of God that is over your life, over your family, over your children. You might be going through diseases. You might be going through challenges. You might be going through coronavirus. You might be going through uh, a loss of job. You might be going through financial crisis. But my friend, my brother, my sister, listen to me. The Lord's hand is over your life. He is not planning to let you down. He has never let you down before. And he is not going to do it now remember the God himself will prosper you don't let the challenges stop you don't let it slow you down but rather let it strengthen your faith let it strengthen whoever is talking against you say thank you Jesus that's going to strengthen my faith I'm going to keep going because God is with me and the third thing write this down this is very important Number one is uh, turn your burdens into prayer. Number two is uh, turn, you know, don't let your adversaries uh, stop you, but strengthen your faith. And the third thing is don't let conspiracy pull you down. Don't let conspiracy pull you down. I want you to take, I want to take you to Nehemiah chapter 6. And we see many things happening between these chapters, but I want to take you to Nehemiah's chapter 6 because what is happening in chapter 6 is that Nehemiah is very close to finishing the wall. 
and he faced a lot of oppression uh, and, and we can read about Nehemiah's generosity in the middle of oppression in chapter 5 but we're not going to go into that today but we are going to stay in Nehemiah chapter 6 because what is happening is that Sanballat and Tobiah are conspiring against Nehemiah to slow down the work. Today the issue we have is that we have created our own Sanballats and our own Tobias in our life. A lot of times, yes, there are other people, other characters who are speaking things and words and lies into your mind that is stopping you and making you doubt yourselves. But then sometimes or many times, we have created our own Sanballats and we have created our own Tobias in our heart who are standing against us. And it is, in fact, it is us standing against ourselves. You see, in Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 8, uh, from verse 1 to 7, you can read it at home. What is happening is that Sanballat and Tobiah are trying to constantly send uh, you know, uh, letters and writings to uh, Nehemiah with some, conspir- with some conspiracies and false accusations. And this is Nehemiah's response. He's saying, no such things as you say are being done. Now they are creating some false accusations against Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is saying, no such things as you are saying is being done, but you invent them in your own heart. These accusations are not real, but they were invented in your own heart. We often create our own conspiracies. We often create in our own heart some things that we believe is true and real when we have created it ourselves. We have, we have created some things through doubt, through fear, because of all the what-ifs that is going on in our head. And, and sometimes we are in a circumstance where we try to please others. And you say to yourself, what if I don't do this? What if I lose this person? What if I say no, I might lose this relationship? What if I don't find a better man than him? What if I don't find a better woman than him? And God is probably clearly talking to you. You need to step away from this relationship. It is not healthy for you. And when God is speaking all these things, we have created our own Sanballats, our own Tobias, and we have invented conspiracies and accusations in our own heart against ourselves. And the enemy is using our insecurities. He's using these feelings to stop you down, to pull you down from your progress. You see, your faith can be persistent only when you're confident in the fact that God's hand is upon your life. Your faith, I want to say this again, I want you to write this down. Your faith can be persistent only when you are confident in the fact that God's hand is upon your life life. Nehemiah was confident. You see in verse 15 in the same chapter it says the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. The wall was done in 52 days. It was over. It was the work is done. But meanwhile there were so many circumstances, challenges that came against Nehemiah to stop him. Are you creating your own conspiracies? Are you accusing yourself for some of the things? Maybe as a father, maybe you're accusing yourself of something that happened in your past. Maybe a bad relationship in your family. Maybe you did not model good fatherhood. And maybe God is speaking to you today. It is not too late. Don't accuse yourself for it. It is time to move forward, change your ways and do your best with the strength of God because God's hand is over your life. Maybe your mother watching this and you're feeling the same. I want to tell you, don't accuse yourself with the lies that the devil has put in your heart. Don't doubt yourself. Don't let fear cripple you. But rather, be persistent in faith, knowing and in confidence that God's hand is over your life. We got to understand that in order to have a persistent faith like Nehemiah, we have to go through a process. There's a process that Nehemiah went through. And when we understand the process, 
And the three key things that we, that we learned today, number one is that he turned his burdens into prayers, not into depression, not into sadness, but into prayer. And he took a bold step of faith in approaching the king for favor after his prayer. Number two is he did not let his adversaries, his enemies, his challenges to bring him down, but rather it strengthened his faith. And number three is he did not let any conspiracy or false accusation to stop him because he was confident that God's hand was over his life and he was righteous in the eyes of God. He was doing the right thing. Even though not everybody was with him, he knew that God has called him to do something and he did not wait for everybody to be with him. He did not wait for his enemies to become his friends. He went ahead and did it with the confidence knowing that God's hand is over his life. Don't let your own heart conspire against you. Why don't we take a moment, give our life to God today that we will allow these key aspects, these key elements to shape our faith, to shape our life, to rechange it, to redesign our life so that our faith will become persistent. A lot of times it is these things that pulls our faith down. It is the burdens that pulls our faith down. It is the enemies, it is the, it's the adversaries and the challenges and the situations and the false accusations that we have created our, against ourselves that is pulling us down. The Lord is speaking to you today, my friend, and He's telling you the Lord's hand is over His life just as how Nehemiah said, God himself will prosper us. Yes, God himself will prosper you. Trust in him and be persistent in faith.